Welcome to the Radical Rhythm Podcast. This has been created for those of us that love radical women who live perhaps by the rules, but also question and challenge the status quo. We want more from our lives, to enjoy our sexuality, to explore radical thought, and to celebrate women who have lived and continue to live unconventional lives. Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Baer, sexologist, educator, activist, and definitely a radical woman. Thank you for joining me as I share stories of women challenging the status quo and living life to the fullest. Join me as we unapologetically march to the beat of a different drummer together. Well, here we are again, Vi. We're at the Carter Johnson Leather Library and Collection in Evansville, Indiana. Thank you so much for gracing me with your presence again here at your library. I appreciate that I was allowed to visit again. Well, you know, we are calling this technically the center, but the reality is it's Tony's place. <laughs> you got the keys. That's true. That's true. So I, I snuck back in again. I'm at the library. And for this podcast, I mean, Vi, we were in the other building before, and we were in the rare book room, and we visited 19th century Paris together, and then we visited 19th century Kansas together. And, and today I wanted to ask you about a topic that's more current. And when I think about it, we're only talking 40 years ago, so that's the modern age, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, as I look around this library, there are magazines and books that have women in leather pants and leather jackets looking all badass. And I, I wanted to dedicate this program to finding out who they are and, and what they did and how they kind of paved the way for folks to walk through that door after them. And, and you tell me that there are four cornerstones of the modern women's leather movement. Can you tell me more about that term, modern cornerstones? What's that mean? Okay. Well, first things first, some of this is going to be prejudicial because the four women that I'm about to talk to you about are all friends, mm -hmm. um, which also tells you more of my age in this crazy community because the four women that my group of leather women look at as those cornerstones are Pat Calivia, Gail Rubin, Dorothy Allison, and Joe Arnone. Um, while there were women before them, these four are the ones everyone remembers in terms of how women's groups evolved, how women's kink and leather literature evolved. Now, let me back up just a bit. When I talk about great ideas all beginning to happen at once, a number of women in the San Francisco area who were already to some extent playing with each other decided that they were just tired of being in the closet about their kink. And in order to find more women like them, they formed a group. They called the group Samwa, giving reference and an honor to the name of the place where O in the book, The Story of O, got some of her training. So they called the group Samoa. And of all of the women who helped form it, the two that are remembered most are Pat Califia and Dr. Gail Rubin. Um, Samoa was relatively short-lived. I believe the group only existed for like, or maybe five years. But in coming out and in publishing, because Samoa produced a number of wonderful pieces of women's literature for other women who were like them, women who were playing rough, women who were badass, women who were wearing leather and proud of it, not just biker leather, but who were wearing their leather because it turned them on in play. They published a pamphlet of about 32 pages called What Colors Your Hanky in reference to 
where were you on the hanky code? Were you um, red and all of the colors that were symbolic of the various fetishes and play practices? And there were wonderful articles in that booklet about how to play, how to play safely, what some of the techniques were, and so on. They went on to publish other works, but the one that is remembered most, because for women of leather, it really was a first, was called Coming to Power. A series of essays, stories, wonderful writing and reading for women who were looking to find others like themselves and for women who were into what it is that we do and how we play. A wonderful place to express what they were doing and how they were doing it and how they were coming to their leather power. So I remember seeing that book and I remember buying that book mm -hmm. and I was not into leather. I was not into SM. It was hot erotica. Yep. Yeah. So if you're interested in, in hot stories, whether it be from the 1980s, I don't think it matters. Nope. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, it's a good book. It's a hot book. But it was very historic in its publication, use, and, um, you know, spread throughout the U.S., while other things had been written, don't get me wrong, it's not like it was the first. It was a first because it was aimed at leather women and it was aimed at lesbians who practiced kinky, hot leather sex. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, the book is still being published. The group is long since out of business. Uh, Samwa, I think, dissolved in the late 70s or early 80s. But uh, through an arrangement that they made, all of the royalties of that book go to support other women's groups and women's charities. So that legacy is still living on through the book Coming to Power and through an extension that was actually done by Patrick Galifia, Pat, now Patrick, and we can talk about that a little later, and uh, a good friend by the of Patrick's by the name of Robin Sweeney that was a second or follow-up to that book. Great. So, so when we talk about the modern women in leather movement, there are four cornerstones, two of which is Pat Califia and Gail Rubin, and they're on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And the organization that is around at that time and uh, is Samoa, and it publishes Coming to Power, and the hanky code. Amongst other things. What color is your hanky? What's happening in the East? Now, great ideas don't stop in one place. Uh, on the East Coast, just about two years later, I think, Dorothy Allison, now a very well-known writer, and her partner at that time, Joe Arnone, were also eager to find other women like themselves, and formed a group called the Lesbian Sex Mafia. It's usually known simply by its letters of LSM, but that stands for the Lesbian Sex Mafia. Uh, and they didn't produce the kind of written legacy Samoa did, but unlike their older sister, the Lesbian Sex Mafia is still around over 40 years later. They're a very active club still to today. Yes. They're active in the tri-state area in terms of uh, their work with gay pride, remembering that Stonewall is where it all began. And they're an active part of the Stonewall Foundation in putting on the Pride Festival and the March. Um, they were active in New York's Leather Pride Night, which raised insane amounts of money for charity. They were very active in supporting the women who were protesting against women against pornography at the infamous Barnard Conference. So LSM, or the Lesbian Sex Mafia, has been around for a long time and formed the other group on the eastern side of the world as the little sister, if you could call it that. And LSM's membership has varied from 40 to five or 600 
but they've also inspired other women's groups now around the world. Mm -hmm. So we haven't ever talked about this before, but why not try to stump you um, <laughs> while we're <laughs> live, right? Why not the North and the South? Why East, West? Why Coast, Coast? Why do you think in that, you know, at that time in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, uh, why isn't something happening in Texas or Chicago? I would look at it not as much East and West Coast, although that is the way it fell out, as it was the two cities the groups were formed in. Sam Wall was formed in the San Francisco area, and San Francisco, regardless of what was going on anywhere else in the world, assumed that they were the end-all, be-all, beginning and end of all things leather. I'm not going to say if they were right or not, but um, Sam Wall's foundations are there. LSM's foundations are New York, and New York was a rocking city in terms of leather in general. There were any number of men's groups. Gay men's SM activist was already there. Um, I believe the Jacks of Color had already been formed. There were a number of Stonewall committees. Um, in terms of play, New York was a pretty hot place to be from the late 70s on because of the men's gay bars and, their, and some of their willingness to allow women in, um, as well as the head clubs that were part of the New York scene from the mid to late 70s on. And then we have the first great club, which was Eulenspiegel. Yeah, and, I'm glad you said that, not me. <laughs> and Eulenspiegel was almost right behind Stonewall in terms of its founding in the early 70s. So all of that leather king fetish energy was in New York. It was the ideal crucible to birth a woman's organization. I cannot say if other cities were as active, at least not at that time. But those two had the energy already in existence to give birth to women's movements. Right. So Dorothy Allison, Joe Arnone, Gail Rubin, and Pat Califia are the four cornerstones of the modern women's leather movement. Yeah. So where are they today? Uh, let me see now. Um, looking at Pat's history, which is, in terms of liter literary, is long and wonderful. Pat's list of books is one of the hottest lists of erotic reading for lesbians anywhere. Leather Dykes, even better. Uh, you know, from doing it for Daddy and her work on Frontier and a lot of other things that she had parts of. Um, Pat is now, has transitioned and is now Patrick and is still writing and contributing. You can find um, Patrick on Facebook, uh, writing editorials and still contributing to the community that they help build. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dorothy has somewhat retreated into quiet family life, not entirely, but her writing career is astounding, including uh, a book that I believe she won the book equivalent of an Emmy for. I know she won, uh, won numerous Lambda Awards and ultimately Bastard Out of Carolina, which is semi-autobiographical was made into a movie by Angelica Houston. So she's in, or just outside of, I believe, San Francisco with her partner of at least 20 years and their son. Wow. So I thought she was in um, North Carolina. It's the book that's in Carolina. That's where she started. She okay. ended up on the other coast. And Joe Arnone? Joe has, she would love to say retreat and retire. That's a lie. Joe will never retire. Um, is probably this community's primo auctioneer. Has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for charities. When it comes to raising money for charity, there's nobody like her. But one of those sides that very few people 
know about Joe is that she runs a foundation. She runs a nonprofit called By the Grace of George and has been running that for about 22 or 23 years. George was her favorite dog. And uh, when George died, she named the foundation that buys pet food for, and not just dog food, but for any pet, for people who can't afford it. Originally, it started to raise money and buy food for the animals of people with AIDS. But it has expanded to senior citizens, the disabled. Um, a lot of people have gotten to keep their companion animals and their service animals because of Joe and by the grace of George. And then if I'm going to just let secrets out of the bag because I can, uh, she's a naturalist and an absolute sucker for animals. If you need to find out about how to rehab an injured raccoon, talk to Joe. If you want to know about a species of butterfly, talk to Joe. When it comes to understanding, rehabbing, and saving the wildlife of this planet, there's nobody like her. And Dr. Gail Rubin? Dr. Gail Rubin. Um... Useless trivia because I've got a head full of it. The first great dissertation on this tribe was produced by Gail Rubin in the late 80s. Late 80s, early 90s. Uh, it is a dissertation, all other dissertations and theses, quote. She is still writing profusely, editing, um, and now also working with Dr. Rob Bienvenu and other professional psychiatrists and psychologists with a group called CARIS and what that stands for, forgive me, I do not remember. In terms of enlightening, updating, and doing research on and for what it is we do to enlighten the medical community, the law community, the uh, professionals about understanding what kink is and what kink isn't. So I, this half an hour always goes so fast, uh, Vi. But I think we'd be remiss if we didn't answer this last question. So what? Why would a woman who's a radical woman who's tuning into this podcast today care about these four women and the leather movement. What does that have to do with their sexual freedom today? The very fact that they can tune into this podcast today is because of those four women and a few more just like them. Women who dared to stand up against establishment. And for those of your um, viewers who are curious, go do some research on the Barnard Conference and understand what those women laid on the line to fight for the right to be sexually free. Look at the work of Dr. Gail Rubin, who is still writing about the right of women for sexual freedom. Um, look at some of the problems of men of the 80s and everything they had to fight for to keep their humanity, and that included their pets, because their pets gave them a safe place to feel their emotions and to feel safe. All of that was done by Joe Arnone. Look at the work of Patrick Califia and all of the establishments that she stood up against because they were willing to do so, not just with their money and the fact that they were on the picket line, but with writings that would reach thousands, that would reach thousands more, that might begin to change minds, and it did, and law that allows us to do what we do today. Yeah, I, all four individuals have helped me a great deal personally. And when I came out as a lesbian, as gay in the late 80s, Pat Califia's books were there for me to find. And they laid down the beacon for me to follow. And I am very appreciative of all of them I just didn't know the other three at the time and how much they contributed to my, 
to my coming out in in uh, in my own sexuality. Now, Tony, I admit some of that is prejudicial, um, because I am privileged, make that honored, to be able to say that all four women are friends. I was in the right place at the right time to be a disciple to the work that they did. And you and I have talked about the meaning of that word before. To be a disciple to an event is to be willing to tell that event. And I am very proud to talk about the work that they did because I got to watch it, but I got to watch and be and explore who I am because they busted their ass to make sure that I had that freedom. Wow. By once again, thank you so much for being on the program and inviting me to this wonderful place called the Carter Johnson Leather Library and Collection in Evansville, Indiana. Who knew Indiana was going to be the center of women's leather and kink? And, um, and you've created this great place. Thank you again for being on our show today. My pleasure, Tony, and welcome back home. Thank you for listening to the Radical Rhythm podcast today. It has truly been my pleasure to bring stories of intrigue, mystery, sexuality, and radical women, women who do it, whatever it is, differently than other folks in our society. If you're interested in working with me, Dr. Tony Bear, my website is www.tonybearedd.com. On the website, you'll find my course, Aphrodite Secrets. You'll find my group coaching program, my community, whether it's the free Facebook community or my paid subscription community, and different events. I, I love to teach live, whether it be a workshop or a retreat, right now I am booking folks to go to Costa Rica with me in May 22. Um, how exciting is that? <laughs> Please check out my website, www.tonybearedd.com, where you find more information. Once again, thank you for listening to my podcast today. Enjoy life. Go make a difference. Have fun. And don't let anyone dim your shine. <laughs>